So as we worship on this Monday, Thursday, through this devotional time together, uh, we're going to look at the Monday, Thursday story, the story of the Last Supper, Jesus with his disciples, in the words of John 13. I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open up to John 13 right now. Pause this if you need to. And we're going to follow along in what Jesus does and what that means for you and for me. As we engage the text, I want to start by asking you this question. Who do you know who has the smelliest feet? Who do you know that has the smelliest feet? In our house, that is a tough, tough question because, well, we are a house filled with athletes. So to be honest, it's any one of our children after they compete in any one of their sporting events. In fact, the car after a sporting event is a very smelly place to be. We actually have instituted a rule, and that is no one is allowed to take their shoes off until they get home. It is horrendous. And one of the worst parts is they can't even smell their own smell. They stink, but they don't even know it. I hate to say it, but the truth is, You and I, there's often times where we smell and we don't know it. But it's not the stench of our feet or our odor, but it's the stench of sin. And we don't know that we smell that bad. In fact, many times we try to disguise it, hide it, ignore it. Scripture warns us about that. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And oftentimes, we do try to deceive ourselves, and we try to deceive the people who are around us by causing them to believe that we're not as bad. We don't smell as bad. The stench of our life is not as bad. We are like children who stink, but honestly don't care or don't notice it. And while our children can, if they would actually do it, take care of their own stench, the truth is that you and I, we can't take care of the stench of our sin on our own. It's too great. It's too powerful. It is too overwhelming. We need someone else to come in and to take away that which we cannot take away on our own. It's the text of John chapter 13. As Jesus gathers together for the feast of the Passover, it says, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. In fact, one of the ways you could say that is, He loved them to the utmost, to the end of his heart, with everything that he has. Jesus loved his disciples. He had great compassion, care, concern for them. He loved them to the very end of his life, and he loved them with every ounce of his being. And the truth is, this is how God loves you. God loves you to the very end to the end of your life, and with every ounce of his being, God loves you. He loved his disciples. And it said then, during that supper, in that upper room, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God, Sometimes we bypass that phrase, but that phrase is very significant. It says that he knew the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God. Jesus knew where he was going. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew about the suffering that was yet to come. And it says, and God had given everything into his hands. And Jesus knew if he had wanted to, he had power to stop it all. He did. He could have walked away at any moment. Jesus didn't need to die for himself. He died for you. He gave his life 
for your life, for your sake, not for his sake. Out of his great love, his passion, his care for you. And instead of walking away, Jesus, in this next part of this text, shows not his glory, but his humility, his humbleness, humbling himself for his disciples. Since Jesus rose from the supper, he laid aside his outer garment, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head then. Jesus said, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet. But he is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Cleanliness. You know, in the past few weeks, we've learned a lot about the importance of cleanliness. Wash your hands, disinfect your hands, disinfect the things around you, wipe down door handles, don't touch your face. Cleanliness. When we think about cleanliness in the scriptures, uncleanliness is the result of sin. It's the stain of sin. The stain that covers each and every one of us. We are all filled, touched with this dirt, this filthiness, this stain. Peter here in this text seems to be the main antagonist, but I'm going to tell you that there is somebody else who is present at this time, who, who great, gives a greater understanding to how much Jesus humbles himself. So as Jesus goes around with his wash basin, and begins to take the water out and wash the disciples' feet one by one, cleansing them, getting rid of the dirt. He comes to Peter. And as he goes down to wash Peter's feet, uh, Peter says, don't wash me. This is the servant's job. It's not your job. It is the lowliest. What's interesting is if we think about this, the disciples would have had no problem washing Jesus' feet, but not one of them is willing to wash any of the other disciples' feet. Because the person who washes feet is considered the lowest on the totem pole. They were the lowest of the servants. They, they did the dirtiest of the jobs. And so while they would have washed Jesus' feet, not one of them would have stooped low enough to wash the feet of somebody else, another one of the disciples. It's oftentimes how children act at home. Children are oftentimes willing to help their parents, to listen to their parents, or at least they're more quick to do that than they are to help and serve one of their siblings because they understand their relationship to their parents and yet oftentimes they fight for dominance and authority or to resist humility with their brother or sister. And yet this washing of feet, this is exactly the image of what Jesus does for you and for me. In fact, we see this in Philippians as uh, we hear Paul speak about Jesus' willingness to humble himself. It says, Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, humbled himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself as a servant for his disciples. What's interesting about this is, is when you clean somebody's feet, when, when you use your hands to clean them and a towel to clean them, 
Where does the dirt go? Well, the dirt either transfers from their feet to your hands or from their feet to this towel, but the dirt has to go somewhere. By cleaning their feet, Jesus took on their dirt. Their stench became his. And though I'm sure he washed his hands, imagine having to eat just moments later with the same hands that just touched dirty feet. He took on their dirt for them. Scripture says it this way, that Jesus, he who was without sin, became sin for us, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is your righteousness and mine. He is your grace, your forgiveness, your love poured out for you in what he has done. You see, true cleanliness is the work of one person and one person only, Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes the unclean clean and the unworthy worthy. In fact, in this text, we see how much Jesus makes the unworthy worthy. Because notice, who was there when Jesus washed feet? It wasn't just Peter, was it? John makes it very clear that as Jesus is going around to wash feet, that the one that he knew in verse 11, who was to betray him, was there. He washed the feet of a denier, a doubter, and he washed the feet of the one who would betray him. And you would think, who, who is most unworthy at that moment to have their feet washed? Well, I would say it was Judas. And yet, Jesus didn't pass over him where Jesus didn't have him leave and then wash feet. Jesus washed his feet. Do you know this Last Supper comes in the context of the Passover. And when you think of the Passover meal as, as they would gather together and have bread and wine together, it was the time when Jesus instituted the Last Supper or what we now practice as communion, where we receive the very body and the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. In the midst of that celebration of the Passover, as they would remember what Jesus had done for them in Egypt, as he had sent the angel who went and who killed the firstborn of all who were in Egypt, except those whose blood covered their doorpost. I love this image. This image that you see on your screen right now is the beautiful image of what the Passover was all about. You see, that angel didn't look to see who was worthy in the house. He looked to see whose doorpost was covered with the blood of the one who was without blemish or stain, the lamb. And Jesus doesn't say you are worthy because of what you have done. And he doesn't say you are clean because you have cleaned yourself. He says you are worthy and you are clean because you are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who makes the unworthy worthy and the unclean clean. It is in baptism when water is poured over the head of that infant that that child is made clean in Jesus Christ. And you, because of the forgiveness of sins and what Jesus has done on the cross, he has cleansed you and he has made you worthy to be an heir of the kingdom of heaven. And then what does this mean for us? Well, it means what the end of this text says. It says, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If I then... Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. He says, as God has made you who are unclean, clean. He says, therefore, humbly serve others. Regardless of the worthiness you see in somebody else, humbly serve others. Forgive them as God has forgiven you you, and serve them out of the same love and service that God has shown to you in Jesus Christ, who, 
in the very nature God was willing to put on a towel and pick up a wash basin and wash the dirtiest of feet. You know, you and I right now, we are trapped at home, or at least many of us feel that way. And it could be a time of great stress. And there could be a lot of times where instead of serving others, it's more easy to say things like, can you get me? Can you do for me? Would you? Where we ask others to serve. But I want to encourage you to think about this. Or I want to challenge you with this. For one day, instead of asking someone to serve you, serve them. Serve all day. And see how it changes everything. Over the next few days, as we continue to worship together, both on Good Friday and then into Easter, we're going to see that things get worse before they get better. And you know what? It's very much like the world we live in today. It seems like things just keep getting worse. But it always gets worse before it gets better. And they will get better. Things will change because Jesus changes everything. He changed the feet of the disciples as he washed what was dirty and made it clean. And he changes your life and mine as he makes the unworthy worthy and the unclean clean so that in Jesus we might know what it means to be a humble servant so that you and I out of his great love, might humbly serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being that amazing example of humility so that we might know what it means to serve others selflessly, regardless of the worthiness and the value that we put on others that we are called to serve. So Lord, uh, we pray that as you have made us who are unworthy, worthy, and who are unclean, clean, that we might go out now and we might humbly serve those that we feel are unworthy, but who are made in the image of God. So Lord, help us to be your servants. Help us to put on a towel and pick up a wash basin and to serve those who are around us so that in our service we might point people to the one who has served us and has made us clean. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God's blessings to you as you continue to worship Jesus and are reminded of what he has done for you throughout these next days of Holy Week.